Semiconductors are tiny chips that make practically every single digital technology we see today possible. And in the 1990s, Europe, not the United States or South Korea, was the leader in charge of producing them. It had a market share of 44%, the United States had 37 and South Korea 19 And this distribution was mainly the result of the early success of European mobile phone companies like Ericsson, Nokia, and Siemens, but known to many, this position was short-lived. Over the past couple of decades, European mobile phone companies lost their dominant early positions, and semiconductor markets were largely outsourced due to reductions in labor costs. Today, in 2021, Europe sits on around an 8-10% to market share, while China, Taiwan, and South Korea own 24, 21, and 19% respectively. Compared to the 1990s, Europe's position today is a lot less, and Europe is currently taking steps to regain some of its previous position by setting a goal for a 20% market share for semiconductor manufacturing by 2030. And this goal represents more than simply achieving a larger portion of chip production. Europe's aim with boosting manufacturing for semiconductors represents one puzzle piece of a much larger goal, Europe's strategic autonomy, a European goal to reduce reliance on external countries and strengthen its ability to defend itself. Semiconductors are the building blocks of every single digital technology we see today. And this means that when semiconductor manufacturing faces a supplier demand shock, like we're currently seeing right now, it can ripple through multiple lucrative industries that affects consumers. If those supply shocks are nationally delineated, countries can scream that they've become overly reliant on entities located outside of their borders. For instance, TSMC, a single Taiwanese chip manufacturing company, is responsible for manufacturing about 92% of the world's most sophisticated microchips and helps produce 90% of the chips that are used by Apple, Amazon, Google, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, and AMD. So, if something geopolitically contentious were to occur in a place like Taiwan, I don't know, that's just a, an example, that could have severe ramifications for other industries and ripple its way down multiple supply chains. And it's abundantly clear that this dynamic is one of the main causes of Europe trying to consolidate semiconductor manufacturing. Thierry Breton, the European Commissioner for the Internal Market, who has been spearheading the EU's investment in semiconductors, has stated, do we, Europe, want to be in the driving seat of the digital transformation or be subject to the choices of others? Do we want Europe to lead and set our own rules or accept to be a simple bystander? With political will and industrial commitment, we can make sure that Europe is back on the semiconductor race. If this doesn't sound like a state representative attempting to reduce reliance external to their state's borders, I don't know what is. But there also seems to be other intentions besides reducing vulnerability to supply chain disruptions. For example, it's not just that the EU wants to increase the supply of chips on home soil, but the EU has made it clear that they want to produce the most advanced semiconductors on the planet. Currently, Europe's largest industries do not need highly advanced semiconductors because most major consumer electronics companies are located in the US. And the auto sector in Europe, which is strong, is not in need of such extremely advanced semiconductors. The fact that Europe would be pushing for producing the most advanced semiconductors means that it's not just focused on having enough chips when supply chains are disrupted. It means that Europe is also aiming to increase its chance for grabbing onto future growth and being a more powerful piece of that supply chain. However, as always, talking about the EU's aims is fundamentally different than talking about what is possible. Semiconductors, as you could probably assume, are not cheap, and setting up manufacturing factories takes a lot of time and money. One thing governments are notoriously good at, though, is throwing lots of money at big problems. And the money that is being prepared to be thrown over the next decade seems to be a lot. From 2000 to 2020, China had around 50 billion in direct incentives for manufacturing semiconductors. South Korea had 7 to 10, Taiwan 0.5, Europe a bit over 2.5, and the United States, of course, at zero. But in 2021, it seems like countries are feeling the need to spend their stimulus checks, and South Korea has become an obvious leader, pledging $450 billion over a decade. The U.S. Senate has passed $50 billion, but the EU has pledged more than the U.S., a whopping $150 billion in investment, which will obviously coincide with different individual member state strategies. The funding by the EU will be used to push chip foundries on European soil by encouraging manufacturers like TSMC and Intel to build fabs in Europe. Also, it will likely coincide in boosting talent for making advanced semiconductors by working with already existing research institutes like Fraunhofer in Germany, IMEC in Belgium, and CEA Lati in France. 
The overall strategy, though, will be to build an alliance of firm, institutes, and national governments in order to pool enough investment. Whether reaching the EU's goals is a giant waste of money is honestly unclear. Some will say that Europe is going to squander money by trying to compete in a market that they are too far behind in and that they should focus instead on increasing their leverage in the specialized areas where they do lead. But this is a fundamental tension that will be raised with every risky investment decision. It's very likely that digital technologies will continue to advance over the next few decades and bring with it trillions of dollars in potential value, and there will be plenty of other future opportunities for vulnerable supply chains to be disrupted. Europe could, of course, decide to play it safe, but Europe could also, of course, play it risky, which definitely opens up the potential for tremendous waste, but it also opens up the potential for tremendous growth and power.